they used to be. Too often they follow a script and invariably the outcome is known in advance. Tony Howard now looks at the events of this week and back at some of the more spirited conventions of the past. Madam Secretary, I'm Larry Echo Hawk, Attorney General for the great state of Idaho, where we know how to spell potato. Idaho cast 22 votes for the next president of the United States, Bill Clinton. The roll call of states traditionally provides the climax of an American convention. For years, it's been a pretty empty ritual, but no one seems to want to get rid of it. Probably because it reminds everyone of the days when American party conventions actually counted for something in the political process. The party convention used to be a forum of decision. Now, in effect, it's a ceremony of ratification. The choice is determined uh, before the delegates gather in the convention. Alaska is proud to cast all of its votes for the man who can carry us into the next century, Bill Clinton. The conventions haven't always been as tidy as that. 1960 probably represented the last hurrah of the old style politics. And here's Stevenson coming into the convention hall now. You can just see him there, a little man with a bald head. His entrance makes the sensation of the week. His reception is terrific. For a candidate to appear in the hall before nomination is quite unprecedented. At least some of those who came to Los Angeles that year didn't know the new rules and tried to play the game as it had always been. Their hero was this man, Adlai Stevenson, a twice-defeated Democratic candidate who they're not an active contender on this occasion, they wanted to draft into the nomination. The strategy was to start a stampede on his behalf, and it nearly worked. I won't attempt to tell you how grateful I am for this tumultuous and moving welcome. I have, however, a an observation. I've decided that I know who you're going to nominate. It will be the last survivor. Stevenson, as he may even have intended, finally buried his remaining presidential aspirations with that one characteristic quip. The truth was that this man had changed everything. By blasting his way through the primaries, he'd made that year's convention almost redundant. When he arrived at the hall, it was virtually as a monarch striding towards his own coronation. We will carry the fight to the people in the fall, and we shall win. What no one, of course, knew then was that a dynasty had been founded. Eight years later, and after President Kennedy's assassination, it was Robert Kennedy's turn to seek the presidency. This is a generous and compassionate country. That's what I want this country to stand for, not violence. Not lawlessness, not disorder, but compassion and love and peace. That's what this country should stand for, and that's what I intend to do if I'm elected president. Again, the tactic had to be to rely on the voters to wrest the prize from the party power structure. And since Kennedy was shot on the night of the Californian primary, no one can ever know whether it would ultimately have succeeded. The Kennedy who came nearest to restoring conventions to their former status was the youngest of the brothers, Edward in 1980. He actually dared to challenge an incumbent president and took the fight right to the convention floor. A united Democratic Party in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts cast 77 votes for Senator Kennedy. Madam Chairperson, the great state of Massachusetts is proud in a united manner to cast 34 votes for the next president, Jimmy Carter. The first convention I ever went to, there was actually a steam engine on the floor. It came from Utah and blew with splendid impartiality as various elderly, overweight congressmen trudged their way round the arena. Of course, technology has long since banished all that. Today, the computer screen and electronics rule the roost. 
It's progress, I suppose, in a way. But I also wonder if it isn't perhaps a measure of the way in which the lifeblood has flown out of the American political convention. Of course, everyone still tries hard to keep the show on the road. And there could be no faulting the piece of theatre the Democrats produced this week. But theatre it was, with the delegates performing merely as part of a chorus line. At least as political curios, conventions still, however, have their defenders. It's the one occasion where activists across the country get together, they meet each other, they exchange ideas, they hammer out a platform, uh, they rediscover the existence of the party. It's a means of renewing the party's own sense of identity. And it's also great fun. Anything which can sort of give a party a sense of its own exist, proof of its own existence is helpful. The Democrats in New York. Ironically, it was also in New York, nearly 70 years ago, that the most famous of all conventions took place. The Democrats came here in 1924 and set a record by taking 103 ballots, stretching over two and a half weeks, to select a party standard ballot. John W. Davis, former ambassador to Great Britain, finally nominated. Poor John Davis, a last-minute compromise choice, proved a lackluster candidate and went down to defeat. The last Democratic convention, where the contest for nomination went beyond a single ballot, took place in 1952, when on his first outing, Governor Adlai Stevenson of Illinois was drafted as the party's candidate. Last night, with no real opposition in sight, Governor Clinton, in his acceptance speech, sounded almost as if he commanded the party in the same way. But the question must remain open, whether a convention still has enough magic attached to it to transform a state governor into an international statesman. Anthony Howard. Listen.